welcome to Kingdom Come Ministries live stream, where our leaders are Apostle William Rogers Jr. and our prophetess, Dr. Donna Rogers. We are so very grateful that you have decided to join us today. Our prayer is that you receive all that God has created you to be. We ask you to contact a friend or a loved one and let them know that there is a word for them on today. Let's prepare our minds to be blessed by the word of God. just come to encourage you in this series hold on <laughs> to your confidence we're going to the book of Hebrews and we're looking at chapter 10 and we're looking at verses 35 through verse 36 the new covenant the NIV version and the word of the Lord says so do not throw away don't you dare get rid of your confidence, your belief in God, your trust in God, because it will be richly rewarded. And you need to persevere. You got to keep going. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And that is the word of the Lord to you. This is personal now to each and every one of you it's it's personal I want you to embrace yourself for this series because God has a lot to say to us to speak to us we're living in times that are unprecedented there's never been a time in history that we are facing what we are facing we've never seen this before we have faced financial crisis before we faced disease and natural disasters and mass shootings and uncertainty before but they have always been isolated events like they have always happened individually Right now, we're facing a world environment where all these things are happening at once. They are collaborating together. And the enemy of our face is using these things to steal, to kill, and destroy our faith. Just let me talk to you. Have, have you ever gotten so exhausted from waiting for God's promise to come to pass that you were tempted to say, forget it? I've waited long enough. Come on now, pastor. I'm not going to sit here and wait any longer. I've given enough of my life to this, this church stuff, this church thing, without realizing it's a God thing. Uh, you, you, you're so tired, so you start saying, I'm tired of this. I'm going to toss the whole thing away and move on with my life. We live in an impatient society, fixated on instant gratification. The desire to experience fulfillment or pleasure without any sort of delay or wait. And a love for shortcuts. A shorter alternative route. We've been conditioned to expect things to happen quickly. Just look at how annoyed we get if our Wi-Fi is slow. If we are put on hold for a few minutes, if a package takes longer than expected to arrive, waiting can be hard. And when people don't get what they want, the psychological reaction is anxiety. To capitalize on that desire, 
Companies are taking consumers' anxiety and sprinting, running away with it, offering same-day delivery services, eliminating the need to wait for a taxi, and providing the ability to stream four seasons of TV shows within seconds. If you think about it, anything can be delivered. Food, flowers, furniture, clean laundry, instant answers on Google, groceries, <laughs> and even people. There are romantic candidates right at your fingertips waiting for you to filter them by location sexuality, religion, and hobbies. Pull me up, just what do you want? Retailers, too, are reaping the benefits of society's growing impatience. Walmart and eBay have challenged Amazon in a battle of which company can deliver the fastest because consumer habits have made it clear that they will pay big bucks to avoid the wait. Leading places like Disney World to profit off of passes that allow consumers to skip the line just to get in front quicker. Perhaps, just maybe, could it be? This is the reason or these comforts make it even harder for us to wait on God? Are you hearing me today? When we read the Bible story of Abraham, we forget or resent how long he had to wait for God's promise to him to materialize. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why the, the Bible allows us to know the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is for our example so we can learn from them so we won't do that. In the book of Genesis, Abraham is credited as being the father of our faith. He had the experience of knowing God as the father, showing that everything comes from God. He did not initiate anything. Have you ever just been going on with your life, ain't bothering nobody, ain't messing with nobody, and God come knocking on your door, emailing you, texting you, just causing all kind of stuff to happen in your life. Abraham didn't initiate anything. God was the initiator of everything. Please come, go with me to the book of Romans. We're looking at chapter 4. We're looking at verses 17 through verse 21. The new covenant, the message version, as we laid this foundation for this series. It says, we call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint. But because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many people. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do only what God could do. Raise the dead to life with the word, make something out of nothing. And when everything was hopeless, without hope, looked like it wasn't going to happen, looked like it couldn't happen, looked like it was not going to come to pass, there was no evidence to make him feel like this thing was going to work. Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made father of a multitude of people. Hmm. God himself said to him, you're going to have a big family, Abraham. I could just imagine. Why would you speak this to me at this age in my life? Because I'm speaking it to you. When you can't do it, you're going to know it's me that done it. All of your resources are going to be gone. 
And you ain't going to be able to see no other way out but through me. He was calling things that were not yet as though they were. And so Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say, it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. See, you have to understand that faithfulness during the time when the promise seems unfulfilled is the measure of our obedience and spiritual maturity. We like to ask God for things, but we don't like to be obedient. We like to ask God for things, but we don't want to mature. When we read the account in the book of Genesis, we get from the point of the promise being spoken to the fulfillment of the promise in just about, maybe about three, five minutes. You know how you read the story, whether you, it's Abraham, whether it's Joseph, when God prophesied to him, you can read the beginning and the end at the same time, but you can't do that with your life. And so you're going to have to have confidence in what God said about you. And we can easily read in the word how this happened and that, how that happened. And then you may be in the middle of your season and you can't seem to see the end. About five minutes, we can just read real quick. Please go with me to Genesis. We're looking at chapter 12 and we're looking at verses 1 through verse 3. The old covenant, the TLB version. And it says, God had told Abram. Who told Abram? Mm-hmm. He says, leave your own country behind you and your own people and go to the land I will guide you to. If you do, I will cause you to become the father of a great nation. I, he, God is constantly telling them, I, I, I will bless you and make your name famous, make your name great, and you will be a blessing to many others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And the entire world will be blessed because of you. We read the promise. Matter of fact, I don't even think that took five, five minutes. We read the promise real quick. And, and we get the prophecies and we get the word of the Lord that's been spoken into our lives real quick. And we shout about it. We cry about it. Sometimes we fall out about it. We happy about it. But Abraham had to wait 25 years before God promised came to fruition in his life. Are y'all hearing me today? Just, just let me talk and lay this foundation. He was 75 years old when he first received the promise. And his wife Sarah was 65 years old and barren, unproductive and unfruitful. You know how the word of the Lord begin to speak into your life and you excited about it and you telling people about it. Oh, please don't get a prophecy in the worship center and everybody hear it. And then after a while, you start feeling shame and embarrassed like I thought. I thought this was supposed to happen to me. I thought this was supposed to come to pass. God, I thought and all your hand lifting and hand clapping and praising and all of that becomes shame and you begin to hold your head down. Abraham realized that he couldn't hold on to the promise in self-confidence, his own judgment, ability, and power. Instead, he needed God-confidence, depending completely upon God and his strength to handle this thing and bring this thing to pass. Abraham knew his pipes wasn't working. He said, I'm, I'm going to need God for this. 25 years that contained 300 months, 9,125 days, 13,140,000 minutes, of waiting, praying, and dreaming about the promise yet to come that was spoken to him. Are you hearing me? 
Because when we get a word, we expect that thing to happen right away. Am I talking to anybody? And we be praying and we be fasting. Oh, I know when I come off this 40-day fast, Pastor, it's going down. And you come off the 40-day fast and God is still quiet concerning what he spoke to you. 25 years must have felt like forever. God, why would you speak something to me and make me wait that long? Plenty of time to think that God had not spoken it. Maybe it wasn't God. Maybe it was the devil. Well, maybe it was just me. Plenty of time to become frustrated. Plenty of time to become impatient. Plenty of time to become bitter. Plenty of time to become painful, allowing the word, the prophetic word that was spoken into your life to, by God to become painful because pain do have a voice. And then you start talking. 25 years, all that time to become irritable. And then you're ready to let go. Please go with me to Genesis chapter 21. We're looking at verses 1 through verse 2, the Old Covenant, the New King James Version. And it says, and the Lord visited Sarah as he said, as he had promised. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. Do we see that? For Sarah, 90 years old, conceived and bore Abraham a son. In his old age of 100. But when did this happen? At the set time. Kairos. God's appointed time. When did it happen? God's appointed time. When are things going to come to pass in your life? Say that like you believe that. At the set time of which God had spoken to him. Not in the chronos time, which represents a chronological time that is calculated in seconds and minutes and, and hours and days and weeks and months and years and decades and centuries and millenniums. See, you expecting God to bring about his promise that he spoke to you in your time. And that's where you get frustrated at. That's where you become bitter. That's where you get irritable and you become impatient because you want God on your timetable instead of letting him be God in your life. And one of the most difficult things about experiencing God's promises is that we want him to answer our prayers and his promises in Kronos time. And we don't understand. We don't understand when God prophesy and speak to us. We don't understand that he's speaking to us according to his time and not ours. Please go to Psalms. We're looking at the 102nd division and we're looking at verse 13, the old covenant, the amplified version. And the word of the Lord says, you will arise and have compassion on Zion, Jerusalem. For it is time to be graces and show favor to her. Yes. The appointed time, the moment designated has come. And so you have to understand that there is a set time, a God time for the favor of God to manifest in our life. And that's the reason why you can't get bothered and you can't let go of your confidence and you can't become fatigued and weary and, and, and frustrated and depressed and become bitter because what God spoke to you is not happening as quick as you want it to. I know I'm talking to somebody in this place and streaming live because God never speak to me to speak to you if, if it's not what he wants you to hear. Are you hearing me? This is a right now word. God wants you to understand. He ain't forgot about you. He see you right in the condition that you are in. And he already got a set time to bring you out. But it ain't your time. Can you just remind yourself, but it's not my time. It's his time. Now, how was Abraham and Sarah going to explain the divine favor of God? Because sometimes favor ain't fair. 
How, how, how are they going to explain this? Abraham, I can imagine his boys was like, dude, you did that? <laughs> how, do we, how do we explain the hand of God and the favor of God on our lives? Because it's unexplainable. God's divine favor have nothing to do with how beautiful we are, how educated we may be, our social economic status, our level of financial prominence, our political persuasion, ethnicity or nationality. It has nothing to do with that. The divine favor of God does not influence our life because of who we are or what we may have done but it comes to our life because of who God is to us. You got to understand, none of God's declarations and promises will ever fail. None of them. Now, when, when you are sure, hmm, there's a scripture that I love to say, and, it, it's, and this is the confidence that I have in him. Not in me. In him. That if I ask anything according to his will, yeah. which is his word, yeah. he hear me. Yeah. And if I know that God have heard me, then I know I have what I've asked because this is the confidence that I have. A lot of times we pray to God, but we don't have confidence in our own prayer. We don't even believe God hear us or God's going to answer our prayer. So then we start going to other people as if they're God. You ain't God up in my life. God told me this. And God is the only one that can bring it to pass. Are you hearing me? He's not like humans. You know, we, 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 we make promises that end up being broken. Contracts that have an end and all other oaths and promises that have a limit to their effectivity. But God will stand firm beyond any other. You got to understand that. Matter of fact, this is what the word says. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being <laughs> that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? That's, that's what he says. Does he promise and not fulfill? Some people can't wait on nothing. You speeding through red lights, can't wait till the light turn green. You getting upset and frustrated, and your character spilling out all over, you bleeding all over the place in the grocery store because you can't even wait in line because it's a little long. Can't wait on nothing. How in the world? Can you wait 25 years for something if you can't wait for the red light to turn green? How can you wait 25 years for a house? Some of you can't wait on nothing. A job, a calling, an opportunity, a relationship, a child. I mean, come on, God. What am I going to do in the meantime while you're telling me to wait? Trust me. Hello? Hello? Sometimes God allow us to be in situations and circumstances and it doesn't mean his hand is not on our life and it doesn't mean that God don't want us to prosper or anything like that. What it means is God working on your character. So you got to understand something about Abraham. Abraham was an idolater, and when God called him, God knew that he was full of all this pus and all of this stuff. He had layers to his life, and God knew I'm going to have to remove those layers, one layer at a time, one layer at a time, one layer, because if, if I give you what you ask for right now then you you're going to be the person that I'm gonna work through so all the families in the earth to, to be blessed and if you still have that idolatry in you then all that idolatry gonna come out of you to all the families in the earth so I'm gonna put a hold on it I'm gonna keep you waiting in midair like an airplane while I remove those layers don't mean you ain't gifted are y'all hearing me today I mean, you ain't talented. 
Uh, don't mean something wrong with you because you in between relationships or in between jobs or in between houses or in between cars. Don't mean, no, God put a hold on it. Why? Because he removing layers off your life. There's some stuff need to be removed out of your life because he don't want that to show up when it have no business showing up. So you, you, you got to understand it. We can't wait on nothing. Now, Pastor, you know I'm struggling because I've been married before and I'm used to being sexually active. You know God know that. Well, maybe he's trying to put a hold on it so you can stop for a while. Okay, all right. Pastor, you're messing with me now. I'm just going to teach, teach the word. You have to understand. Sometimes we just, we just have to wait. And while we wait, and God is developing us, and he's growing us, and he's maturing us. Those layers. Please go with me to 2 Peter. We're looking at chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 8 through verse 9, the new covenant, the message version. Are you still here with me? It says, don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. God isn't late with his promise as some measures, lateness. He's restraining himself on account of you. Did you see that? Holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's given everyone space and time to change. So in other words, for God, a thousand years is like a day, meaning it can happen just that fast. <laughs> and at the same time, a day is like a thousand years, meaning it can happen just that slow. But you can't let go of your confidence. Waiting teaches us patience and perseverance, which are necessary to develop character. C can I tell you something? We need character in our lives. Hello? Uh-huh. Romans chapter 5, we're looking at verses 3 through verse 4, the new covenant, the TLB version. And the word of the Lord says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Do you see that? We can rejoice too when we run into what? Uh, not just when you get a raise and not just when somebody give you some money and not just when you get that new house and that new car and you in that new relationship. No, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Well, how do that happen, Pastor? For we know that they are good for us. This stuff is good for me. Everything I'm dealing with and everything I'm going through. The objective of the enemy is to make me think it's bad for me. Not realize this thing is good for me. Gonna grow me up. Gonna mature me. Gonna cause layers to be removed off my life. Somebody say this is good for me. I know the enemy wants you to look at it like this is bad and, and ain't nothing going to change and I'm going to always be here. No, no, you can't have my confidence in my God now. Just because I'm in a place that's uncomfortable and a place I don't like don't mean I'm going to always be here. This is good for me. David said it was good that I was afflicted. <laughs> that I may know who God is. Are you hearing me? Do I have anybody in here want to bless God because you know you're going through something, but tell yourself, this is good for me. No. Mm. I ain't about to give up. Oh, and I ain't about to quit throwing the towel. Verse 3, it says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they are good for us. What, what do they do? They help us learn to be what? Patient. Mm -hmm. And patience develops strength of character in us and help us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith, our confidence are strong and steady. The longer we wait, the more we realize that the fulfillment of the promise is not in our power. The longer we wait, I don't get discouraged. The longer I wait, I realize God got this. I want to encourage you, hang in there. God is always right on time. <laughs> ah, just encourage yourself, say, I'm going to hang in there. 
See, you gotta understand to begin well is good, but it's not enough because you begin a lot of things good. You start cleaning out your closet, that was good. New year come in, you got a new year resolution, you decide you're going to work out, lose weight, eat right, be healthy, all that's good. But that ain't enough. Because it's only those who stay the course and finish the race that have any hope and gain in the prize. You, you have to be constant. I don't care. And, and I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. You don't let other people processes hinder your progress. Because they clucking in the chicken coop. Don't let that hinder your progress. You cannot allow that to happen. You have to stay the course. Well, pastor, I, I applied for that job and, and they got it. And they didn't even apply for it. Stay the course. Maybe they are allowing God to remove layers off their life quicker than you are. You have to learn how to stay the course. You have to understand a good beginning does not guarantee a good finish. And so we give our life to the Lord and we become Christians and we become believers. And then we don't stay the course. We don't focus. We start drifting off of the foundation. We start drifting. Now anything and everything goes in Christianity. Just anything and everything. We start removing ourselves from the foundation of the word. And then we start giving our opinions and how we feel and what we think. Instead of what God says. We don't stay the course. Please look at 1 Kings. We're looking at chapter 20 and we're looking at verse 11. The old covenant, the amplified version. And it says, Ahab, the king of Israel, answered. Tell him, being Hadad, the king of Syria, a man who puts on his armor to go to battle should not boast like the man who takes it off after the battle has been won. In other words, it's easier to start a fight than to finish. Because we be excited and we, be, we give our life to the Lord and we be excited and, and I love the Lord and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then the problems and the trials and all of that come to strengthen our character and build our faith and cause us to be patient and we ready to let go. It is often in the last stretch of a race that the winner is determined. It is how you climb the last few meters that determine if you will summit a mountain. It is usually the days and hours just before breakthrough that are the hardest. We have to understand this because our world recommends that we should let go when it gets difficult, uncomfortable, and inconvenient. You know when it start, things start getting hard in life and start getting difficult as a Christian? And then the enemy come to bombard your mind and, and, and try to talk you out of your faith and your trust and, and your hope in God. And instead of you holding on, you looking for somebody that's going to encourage you to let go. Second John chapter 1, verse 8, the New Covenant, the Amplified Version says, Watch yourself so that you do not lose what we have accomplished together, but that you may receive a full and perfect reward. When he grants rewards to faithful believers, you have to hold on. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I've seen a lot of things, but I'm still holding on to the end. You, you have to be determined. Your confidence can't be in anybody or anything else but God. Are you hearing me? You have to be determined because faith doesn't make things easy. It makes things possible. It, it, it did, he never told us it was going to be easy. But it makes things possible. When things get difficult, especially when we have been persevering for a while, that is not the time to let go. When what we believe would happen has not happened, that is not the time to let go. And when we are at the end, of our own resources and cannot see a way forward. That is not a time to let go. There are certain seasons of life that you have to learn how to shift when walking with God. 
the first season of life, God is holding your hand. It's, it's, it's like I call it grace in the law. The, the, the law was the school teacher, and God is holding your hand and teaching you what to do and what not to do and don't do this and don't do that and, and this here and that there. And then you get to another season in life where grace come in and the law let your hand go. And you have to learn how to walk as a believer and stay within the boundaries of the word of God and still trust and believe God. Like a parent walking their children to school, maybe when they're in pre-K or kindergarten, and they walk them there and they hold in their hands and they take them all the way to the bus and watch them get on. And then after so many years, the parents stand back for a while and just, I see you, and the child turn around looking and the parents still waving. I see you. Turn around and I see you. Then there come a time when they put that backpack on you and see you out the door. They don't walk you to the bus, and you can't see them, but you got to have confidence that they still there with you. This is how it is as believers as we begin to mature and grow and develop in God, and we can't be looking for any excuse to let go. Go with me to 1 Timothy. We're looking at chapter 6. We're looking at verse 12, the new covenant, the new King James Version. That's the reason why we have to know the word of God and we have to understand the word of God. And the word of God has to be rightly divided. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, the new covenant, the new King James Version. And the word of the Lord says, fight the good fight of faith. That means you're going to have to keep contending. Even if you get knocked down, get up. And keep running. It says lay hold. Hold tightly on eternal life. To which you were also called and have. Confessed. The good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So you have to understand. Since our faith is threatened by doubt. And unbelief. We must persevere. Not give up and fight to the end. And keep on believing God. And keep on trusting his promises. Despite the hardship. Because your faith have to be tested. Are you hearing me? Your faith, what you are professing and praying have to be tested. If you say you believe God, then that that come out of your mouth have to be tested. If you say you trust God and you know God is going to provide for you and take care of you, your faith must be tested. Because doubt is not the absence of faith. Doubt is the questioning of your faith. Your faith going to be questioned too. Do you really believe that? Because you know you, you, you're really emotional and you're happy and, and things are going well and you're excited. Do you really believe that? Your faith is going to be questioned. Unbelief is a determined refusal to believe. It's faithlessness. That's a heart condition which involves spiritual blindness and a determined resistance to God. And so we understand the Apostle Paul. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. The New Covenant, the Amplified Version. This is what he says. He says, I have fought the good and worthy and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith firmly guarding the gospel against error. Got to understand, unbelief is one of the biggest enemies against our faith. When you don't believe God. And when you don't believe God, you calling him a liar. That's what happened in the garden. And when the enemy came, did, did, did God say that you couldn't eat? In other words, he was telling Eve, uh, God didn't lie to you. It's one of the biggest enemies against our faith. It is the hindrance that constantly swallow up our confidence. And the assurance of what God does or intend to do in our life. Because we're too busy looking at the exterior. And we're too busy looking at other things and other people to speak into our life for us to have confidence. That it chokes out and it blinds out what God is saying. And you got to be able to hear God in this hour. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14, all of these scriptures are good for you. The new covenant, the new King James Version. And it says, for we have become partakers, partners of Christ. If we hold, if we maintain 
the beginning of our confidence, steadfast, firm to the end. What do that mean? What you said about the Lord Jesus when you first gave your life to the Lord, the beginning, the beginning of our confidence. When we got saved, and God, I trust you, and God, I believe you, and I rely on you, and you can do anything. I ain't going to let nothing separate me from the love of God, not this, not that, not life, not death, not height, not this, not, 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 nothing. I, I, I don't care. I don't care, Pastor. If I get married and he don't believe God, I ain't going to let nothing separate me from God. I'm just going to hold on to God to the end. I don't care, Pastor, if I get fired from a job or whatever. I'm not going to allow anything to hinder me from constantly believing and trusting God. And all of those words that came out your mouth going to be tested. So you're going to get a spouse that's going to test you. And you're going to get an employer that's going to test you. And you're going to get something that takes away the finances that you had saved up for something else to test you. Now can I hear your testimony right about now? Right about now. Because that confidence from when you first started believing God... You're going to have to hold on to that. God, I said, I trust you, I believe you, and I trust you, and I, don't, I believe you. I don't care what come, I don't care what go. I have confidence in you. Are you hearing me? When you have confidence in things and people, when things and people are gone, your confidence is too. But when you have confidence in God, no matter what happens in life, come on now, I got a witness. No matter what happens in life, you know, I, hey, I can keep going. Will you encourage yourself and say, I can keep going? I, I can keep moving forward. You got to understand this because my confidence wasn't in that house. Thank God for the house, but I still believe God. My confidence wasn't in that vehicle. Thank God for the vehicle, but I still believe God. My confidence was not in that job. Thank God for the job, but I still believe. Do I have any believers in this place? I still believe them. Yes, I do. I still believe them. Come on, tell somebody. I still believe them. Come on now, don't sleep on me. Don't count me out. Just because things are not like I want them to be. If people is not like I want them to be, I still believe God. I have to understand this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the new covenant, the NIV version. So it's showing you where your faith is at. It says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. We have to continue to live like this. I've given my life to the Lord. That's it. Stop. Nothing. How long you been saved? Oh, 20, 30 years. Really? The only way to receive Christ is by faith. And we must continue to live life by faith. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through verse 9, the New Covenant, the New King James Version. Again, these scriptures are good for you. Read over them. Go back over the stream. Listen to them to build your confidence up in God. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God have raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So now what we are confessing is our faith in Jesus. This is a demonstration of the belief of our heart. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through verse 9, the new covenant. The NIV version, this is going to be a real good series. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So now I'm understanding. I, I, I start my life out, this Christian journey in faith. And when I get midway through there, I still have to have faith. And then when I get to the end, I still have to hold on to faith. Because our life is a faith journey. It's a faith journey. You have to understand this. I know you want to do things in your own time and in your own strength and the way you like them. But you're not going to have confidence to hold on to the end that way. 
Our faith is the key that unlocks everything God has for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 6, the new covenant, the NIV version. And so the Bible says, and without faith, without confidence in God, in his fidelity, his truth, his wisdom, his promises, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone come to him must believe, must have confidence that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So to receive, we have to believe. And to believe, take faith. Are you hearing me? Hebrews 11 and 1, the new covenant, the TLB version. It says, what is faith? So it says, it is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. So I got confident in God that if I am in need, my God shall supply all my need. I got confident in God that even though I can't see what I need, it's going to happen because I believe what the word says. Are you hearing me? No, 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 we, we, be, we be speaking stuff like we got, like, well, you know, this, this is going to happen. We have affirmations and we say things, but we don't believe what we're saying. Faith is the solid, unshakable confidence in God, which is built upon insurance that he is faithful to his promise. So because I have confidence in God, when the enemy want to shake my faith and want me to be depressed and want me to feel like, you know, life is, it ain't no good and, and all of this. No, no, I have to remind myself that this is the confidence that I have in him. Uh, the power of life and death is in my tongue and all I got to do is speak it. I don't have to listen to the negativity of the world. I don't have to listen to negative people. I don't have to listen to unbelievers that try to cause me to hang my head low. You have to understand. You got to hold on to your confidence. I'm holding on to it and I'm unemployed. I'm holding on to it and I'm dealing with sickness or disease in my body. I'm, I'm holding on to the confidence of God. You can't let nobody talk you out of your faith and your confidence. Call me crazy. You may not believe it, but I believe God. Are you hearing me? You got to believe God. I need people around me that believe God. I need people to strengthen my faith, not weaken my faith. Come on now. You, you, you may call me crazy. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time. I told you I done seen a lot of things. I've seen miracles. I've seen eyes, blind eyes come open. I've seen my son who was diagnosed with strep pneumonia, meningitis, and they said he would go crazy and, and be mentally retarded. I've seen God open that boy eyes. Come on now. I've seen God provide when there was no provision there. I've seen God save. I've seen him heal. I've seen God deliver. I've seen God make ways out of no way. You got to hold on to your faith. Are you hearing me? Just because things don't line up in your timing. Who am I talking to? Just because them children don't give their life to the Lord in your timing. Just because doors don't open in your timing. Just because you don't have a, a spouse in your timing. Don't lose your confidence. Are you hearing me? You're going to have to believe God. Oh, I feel this. You're going to have to trust and believe God. And, and, and just silence the voice of all that negativity and silence the voice of all that erroneous doctrine and silence the voice of people that's not speaking the word of God. Silence the voice. You're going to have to trust God. Second Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 7. I'm going to have to bring this to a close. The NIV version, the new covenant, says, For we live by faith, not by sight. That's how we live. So why are you crying and whining and pouting over what you see? We live by faith, not by sight. This is how we walk. This is how we live. As believers in Christ, we do not live according to what we see, but according to what we believe. I believe this. 
We do not base our daily living on what we see outwardly, but what we believe inwardly. Faith powers everything in the Christian life like electricity powers every appliance in our home. Everything. Everything. You have to understand this. If there's a power outage and your TV won't turn on, the problem is there's no electricity. You have to understand. Same with the Christian life. You got to understand when there's a lack of joy and a lack of peace and a lack of love and obedience and all of that, uh, your problem is your faith. You got a faith problem. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem there. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 7, and I'm going to have to come to a close here. I have two more scriptures and I'm coming to a close. The old covenant, the NLT version, it says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. Putting your confidence in God and trust in God. God, I believe you. I'm just going to stand here and wait on you. I'm just going to hold on to every promise. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stay right here. God wants us to have confidence in life. Somebody say, God wants me to have confidence in life. But you got to understand what confidence that he wants you to have. Not boastful, arrogant pride, but an assured knowledge of who we are in him. Our self-worth, please hear me, should be seen through the eyes of God. Because that's the reason why so many people have low self-esteem and don't have no self-worth. Because things that were spoken into your life and told you from when you was a little girl in the closet sucking your thumb. Or you was that little boy sitting there in the garage. Your self-worth and your self-esteem has been beat up and tore down. And people have said things to you. Whether it was your parents or your uncles and aunties, cousins, been molested by the next door neighbor or whatever. They have destroyed your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And you have to understand our self-worth should not come from nobody else but God. What did God say about you? And because things you have experienced in life and things you have been through don't change what God has said about you. And you're still holding on to what other people have said about you and caused you. To feel less than who God says. You got to understand this. Our self-esteem and our self-worth don't come from people. Come from God. Who God says we are. And you have to understand that. I feel that. That's why I just hesitated there. Because I feel that in the room. Because there's so many people. I don't know what have happened in your life, whether you've been raped or molested or you had to go from foster home to foster home. I don't know what has happened in your life, whether you've been hurt in somebody's church or hurt on somebody's job or hurt in a marriage, in a relationship. I don't care what. I don't know what have happened to you and words have been spoken to you to make you feel less than who you are. You have to make sure that your confidence is in who God says you are you was in a bad marriage and that man or that woman spoke negativity to you and made you feel less than a man then you have to listen to who God says you are as a man or as a woman are you hearing me today you have to listen so that confidence can be built back up we all need confidence but the question is where does true confidence come from it only comes from Christ. And that's the reason why people, they, they, they say they're believers in the Lord, and they try to move forward in life, but they stuck. Because they keep hearing those words repeated in their ear. You've seen your father beat your mother. You've seen your mother have an affair on your father. And you just, the, the words, you've seen even siblings beat up on each other. And you done been there and, and all of that. And your mom working five and six jobs. And you at home trying to take care of the siblings. And, and things is happening in the home. And it just makes you feel less of who you are. And then you are silent suffering. You keep all this stuff within you. And then you hurt as a child. And guess what? You become hurt as an adult. 
And hurt people do what? Hurt people. And you have to experience all this stuff. Well, pastor, how can I have confidence when all I've heard is you ain't nothing and you'll never be nothing and you ain't no good and you ain't better than this one because this one went to college and, and got a degree and you didn't. Well, maybe it ain't on my life to go to college and get a degree. Can I just talk to the church? Or this one doing this and, 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 you, and, and you not. Well, maybe that's not the way that God wants the oil to flow on my life. And so you're trying to find yourself and you're trying to size yourself up by who's close to you or next to you and what this one doing or what this one or you're not this ethnicity and, and, and your husband went to this one or your wife went to this one and you feel like I can't compete with that race. You got to know who you are. You got to know who you are in the Lord Jesus. Are you hearing me? We all need confidence. Again, but the question is, where does true confidence come from? It only come from Christ. Listen to me. Large girls, large boys. Just because you are size larger than other women and men, don't you lose your confidence. Big girls rock. <laughs> Just thought I would throw a little little confidence your way. <laughs> Start out, throw it your way. If our confidence is coming from any other source, it's going to fail in the end. I have two more scriptures and I'm closing. If it's coming from any other source, if you allow anybody else to speak into your spirit who you are. There's, there's one of the things I always enjoy apostles saying, and, and, and I picked it up. You know, you have to know who God called you to be. And I remember when he was sharing some things with me about my life and, and, and what I was supposed to walk in and, and all of that. And one of the things I learned, God called me, but he confirmed the call. Don't you let nobody confirm something on your life that God didn't call. You got to walk in that confidence. You have to know what God has said. Because we live in a generation where confidence is found in status. It's found in relationships. It's found in money and cars and houses and clothes. It's found in beauty and careers and achievement and education and goals and popularity. And so now you try to measure yourself up to this and that. And you may not have any of them. And people try to build their confidence from an outside source instead of an inside source. And you know the things you start saying. If only I had this, I would be more confident. Well, if only I looked like this, Pastor, I would, be, I would have more confidence when our confidence don't come from things. It comes from God. And when our confidence comes from anything other than God, we'll never be satisfied, and we won't make it to the end. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. I have one more scripture, and I'm closing. The New Covenant, the NIV verse, it says, But we do not belong to those who shrink back, draw back, abandon the faith. And are destroyed, but to those who have faith, confident in Christ, and are saved. Let me share something with you. Drawing back in the Christian life is sometimes due to disappointment. Because you expected God to come through on your time instead of his time. Then you got disappointed. And then you decided, well, you know what, Pastor? I'm, I, I'm just done with that church thing. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just tired of that. I'm just, why? Because you're disappointed because God didn't come through on your time. He came through on his. And well, but Pastor, I just, I just need a little break, and, and I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Drawing back in the Christian life at other times comes from depression. When you just feel like, you know what, Pastor, I can't take this. There's so much going on in life and so much going on in the world. And I promise you, if you stay out of everybody else's business, you can handle yours, and you won't be so depressed. You know, in, in, in this journey in life, I share with Apostle all the time. I said, I don't have the grace for that anymore. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do that. He, you know, certain things I'd be going through and dealing with, and I'd be talking to him about it, and i tell him, mm -mm, I, I don't have the grace for that. I can't. So now we have to raise up. 
you know, others and, 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 and encourage them and strengthen them and let them hear all that because I, I don't, I, I can't do that. I can't stay confident and, and keep my focus for, for this when, when by now you should be mature. Hello? By now you shouldn't even be talking that way, responding that way, or acting that way. I don't, I, don't, I know. Apostle Paul said, when I was a child, I acted like a child. Behaved like a child, spoke like a child. But when I became mature, I put away all that childish stuff. I'm like, at this age in my life, pastoring the Lord's church, I don't have the grace for certain things. So God said he would give men for us to make sure certain things is carrying out. I don't have time, the, 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 the grace for certain things. Because by now, you should know better. I heard that. Somebody say that again. By now. Yeah. Can I, can I get you to say that? Say, by. And then you get upset and frustrated because don't nobody want to deal with it. Because we done been dealing with this for 30, 40 years. Say it again. Yeah. And so, drawing back in the Christian life is sometimes due to disappointments at other times to depression. Why? Because God didn't come through on your time and now you upset with God. And still at other times, discouragement. Why? Because you don't know who God is. You don't know the God you confess. But most of the times it's distrust. You don't trust God. You don't trust God. You say you do, but you don't. You don't believe God. My last scripture in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11, the New Covenant, the Amplified Version, it says, I am coming quickly. Hold tight what you have so that no one will take your crown by leading you to renounce the faith. Well, it's giving time. Proverbs 18 and 16 says, A gift opens the way and ushers the gift into the presence of the great. Here's a grand opportunity to be ushered into the presence of God by giving to him, as he has so graciously given unto us. Will you take this time to enter into the presence of God with me? By worshiping him through a gift. If so, go ahead, pull out your phone, hit Cash App, and type in the amount of your seed, then dollar sign KCM Tampa 2. If you don't have Cash App, you may go to our web link to sow. I pray that the favor of the Lord forever be upon your life as you sow into this ministry. <laughs>